and a really warm welcome to this Open Table Network uh, webinar. My name's Steve Hilton. Uh, I work at Manchester Cathedral and we're proud supporters of Open Table, which is a growing network of Christian communities that welcome and affirm LGBTQIA people and their families, friends and allies, because uh, more than ever in the church, my dear ones, we need allies. After the webinar, why don't you please go and check out the Open Table website and you'll get a bit more detail there. To say I'm excited about what we've coming up, uh, what's coming up now is a huge understatement. Uh, it is my unbridled joy and delight to introduce a person I've got to know, an inspirational person. Many of you will know him as Donald Bassett in the amazing Russell T Davis Channel 4 drama, It's a Sin. If you don't know what It's a Sin is, where have you been? And when you're done here, you are hereby instructed to go onto the All Four website and to binge watch it, Tissues at the Ready. In his own words, our special guest tonight is a theatre-making, creative, engaging, beat-moving, melody-composing, workshop-leading, storytelling, project managing, digital developing, arts marketing, cake baking, fashion making, model posing, teenage dreaming, jack of all trades. What a business card. But he's also a gay guy living with HIV and he was a Christian, yet in a proper church with proper beliefs, the whole kit and caboodle but he wouldn't identify as a Christian now, but more on that later. Can I just say that the famous casting website called Spotlight tells me that our special guest tonight is 34 years old, but has a playing age of anything between 28 and 36. Now, this is just one of the many things that we have in common. So my queer friends and fellow pilgrims, please join me in welcoming Nathaniel Hall. Nathaniel, welcome! Oh, what a welcome that was, crikey. Uh, my business cards must be A4, mustn't they? With all that information on. It's such a brilliant, I mean, I don't know how you come up with all that. Model posing, fashion making. What was the last cake you baked? Tell us. Uh, the last cake I baked um, was for my brother's 40th birthday a couple of weeks ago. I did a three-tiered lemon sponge with uh, non-dairy cream and berries but the non-dairy cream I've never used before on a cake and it's sort of held in the fridge and then when I took it out it started to go a bit a bit slidey it's it, a bit sad in the sunshine humble. no it was fine it, it all was all fine and it tasted great and I also made a chocolate orange gluten-free chocolate orange cake as well gluten-free chocolate orange right can I just put an order in for that please yeah it's very nice it's a Nigella recipe it's beautiful <laughs> Right, listen, what's going to happen this evening, folks? It's so good to see um, names uh, flashing up and to welcome everyone. And we've got a good chunk of people here. I think, um, Nathaniel, what we're going to talk about tonight has really shown there's a need to talk about it. And I'm really, really pleased. Um, I want to say that if you're inf uh, affected by anything you hear tonight and you'd like some support, then please reach out. Um, there's no need to be alone. The beautiful people at Open Table are always happy to signpost you so you get the support and encouragement you might need from our network and from specialists like the Terence Higgins Trust and here in Manchester, the George House Trust. You are not alone. So please do get in touch. So I'm just going to dive straight in. Nathaniel, in your own words, you say you are an expert by experience in the art of telling autobiographical stories of health and well-being. How hard do you think it is today to stay positive in a negative world? Oh, I, I see what you did there. Took the strap line from my show and worked it into a question. Um, <laughs> and do you know what? I think, it's, it's, I think it can be incredibly difficult to, to stay positive um, in, in what can sometimes seem like an increasingly negative world um particularly after the year we've all had you know um it's been incredibly difficult on many levels for many people whether that's your personal loss uh, either of, of you know 
friends and relatives um, or you know job or security you know health as well people have lost their you know health has deteriorated whether that be mental or physical over the last year so i think it is really really hard but i think one of the things that i've learned through the journey that i've been on is how stepping up and telling your truth stepping up testifying there's the uh, a bit of religious under uh, religious undertones to the way i talk about it really um from my from my past uh, growing up in the church yeah. but stepping up and telling your truth telling uh, speaking truth to power um for me has only been an, an overwhelmingly positive experience in fact my life transformed but it's in the last three four years you can't imagine how my life has changed so um that's the one thing that i try and encourage others to do now bring, um, bring to the mix oh, that's, a, yeah. that's an amazing thing in um in your book which i have here and i'm going to give an unapologetic plug for obviously it's the book of the play um called the first time uh pretty much a good guess as to what it's about um a smashing picture of you eating a load of pills on the front um and as as, as you suggest talks about the first time and you describe so honestly um about your first time age 16 um, and how you're diagnosed with HIV just two weeks before your 17th birthday. But what's not in the book, and I think part of the reason that we wanted to have this conversation, what's not in the book, is that you were baptised that very same year after your diagnosis, and that the Christian faith had been such a big part of your growing up, your childhood, and into your teenage years. What, Nathaniel, what was it like, before we come on to HIV, but... What was it like as a gay young adult, particularly in your church? Um, coming in I think it's only on reflection that I've really kind of unpicked that experience because I think I just put it behind me in a sense. Um, I, you know, the church I grew up, I grew up in a Baptist church, a, uh, a kind of very community led um, church. We used to go on great church holidays every year down to Exeter or up to Scotland, you know, and got really fun memories of growing up in that a very family oriented environment, a very accepting, a very forgiving environment, actually. Um, and uh, a really diverse group, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of congregation. Um, but I do remember remarks and things being said about homosexuality growing up and those conversations taking place, uh, LGBTQ people being spoken about as other to to everyone else and um, i remember specifically i don't know why i was there at a church members meeting i think my mom couldn't find childcare for me or whatever but i was probably running and playing outside or something but i i think i remember the the, the there was a boys brigade and a girls brigade attached to the church and the new chaplain for the the area um that would have been appointed was openly gay and it was probably around the time probably when i was about 12 13 so it's probably around the time i was coming into my awareness about my sexuality um, and I remember there being a huge thing about it saying that it wasn't right and that uh, um, you know he shouldn't be present at where our, where the boys were going and all that sort of stuff and I, I can remember that quite vividly so there was those those undertones there but I guess at that age you sort of don't necessarily connect the dots to what's going on inside you and um, but yeah. obviously that that idea of being othered or being ashamed of who you are and not that not fully embraced i think i think was there for sure yeah and, and um i want to sort of i want to sort of do it to sin so many of us will know you from that i mean but i'm told there was life before donald bassett so tell us a little bit about life so do donald, before do, the show hang on do donald bassett are you doing <laughs> There we are. Start off message back. I think I think that is. I, I'm a man. It really stays up your hair, right? It, yeah, it's that? got it's got some it's got some stuff on it. Um, yeah, life before <laughs> life before Donald Bassett. Life before it's a sin. I mean, where do we where do we start? Gosh, um, I mean, I was like you say, I was diagnosed at 16, so I came out um, when I was 16 um, uh, as gay. I was head boy at my school, you know, I was a straight A student. Um, I'd met someone older than me in that summer between school and college. Um, he was 10 years older than me. Um, and I'd not had any 
you know, Section 28 kid, I'd not had any positive role models. Um, you know, there was there was no chance of kind of someone my own age was connecting. So obviously it was really intoxicating because this thing that I knew about me, like, and, and it was kind of both intoxicating, but also like my act of rebellion against, you know, my Christian upbringing, against being a straight A student, you know, being all these things. And, you know, we had a summer romance and then and then my mum mom and dad found out and they sort of said, we think he's too old. And I, I they were right. And I, you know, we were from different worlds. So I ended it and went off to college. But that was when I was diagnosed with HIV from that. But I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell my family um, for 15 years. I kept that a secret. Um, and, and until 2017, which was when my life had really gone in this wayward sort of slant in this sort of tangent that I hadn't really expected you know I was I thought I was leading my best queer life but I was you know partying and drugs alcohol sex which are yeah they're all fun things I always say this but only if you're pursuing them for fun and there was you know it was very clear at that point that I was really not having fun and um, that I'd hit a real low and um, I talk about catching myself in the mirror to still awake two days after a house party um, and just not recognizing the person in the mirror anymore um, and feeling deeply yeah. deeply unhappy so then I went on this journey told I told my family in a letter I made the show um, which went to Edinburgh went on tour um, and and yeah and the, one of the things the reasons why I made the show was partly to help force my hand to get this thing out to sort of exorcise this thing inside me um but also because i've been doing lots i do lots of work with other people encouraging them to stand up and tell their story and i was like i keep telling them to be brave yet i was holding this shame and this secret yeah. in my own life so yeah. it was really important for me to to tell this story and to tell it my way with me in the center of it yeah you you describe being diagnosed as positive you, your wording is it was like being hit by a truck I was living with so much fear and stigma, self-hatred and shame. I just, was there a sense that these feelings arrived all at once or did they grow over time? I think, they, I think they grow over time. I think on reflection, you look back at that moment um, and we're very good at minimizing, uh, you know, life-changing moments diagnoses you know uh, when people die or when these traumatic events might happen to us and i think we can be we're quite british and we go that's fine that thing happened i'm going to get on with my life and actually we don't actually really acknowledge the impact of that and over time um you know having done lots of work with my therapist and and on myself in recent years realizing and looking at with compassion at you know the reliance on drugs and alcohol, the reliance on sort of chaotic, toxic relationships, because actually, you know, I, I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, and that m was manifesting yeah. in ways that I didn't understand. In fact, when I was even younger, um, you know, I, I, I would make myself sick as a way of controlling, you know, uh, and kind of trying to deal with this overwhelming sense of anxiety that was within me. Um, and so I think it's, yeah, I think as you grow older and look back, I think you realise those things. But for me, I think at the time I felt, although I probably couldn't express it in this way, um, everything I've been told about, I'd not had any positive sex education about being gay. There'd been no, if you think 2003, who did we have in the media? Like the sun was still like outing people, you know, on, on the front pages. And that was still considered, you know, headline news. Um, so there wasn't the yeah. representation on television and film that we have now, although it could still improve. No, it's sex education at school. We watched a video about a guy who was dying from AIDS. That was the only time we even talked about being gay. That was the first time, in fact, someone had even said, I'm gay, it was, although it was on a TV, in front of me. And then we find out that he's dying from this thing. So right. for me to then burst out, you know, against all that and go, I don't care, this is who I am. And then almost immediately get a HIV diagnosis you can see how powerful that internalized the internalized homophobia that I already live with and that we all you know LGBTQ people have to carry and work through there was a whole yeah. other layer added it was like yeah well you've dipped your foot in your toe in the in that thing and you've got what you deserve like that's it yeah. so 
a real powerful level of uh, layer of shame added on top of the, yeah. the shame about being gay that you have to work through as well. And you, you, you again, you talk in the book, in the play, you, you quote a newspaper headline from the 80s. Um, and if you're, a, if you're a Christian joining us tonight, it's time to um, own some of this. But the headline read, Britain threatened by gay viral plague. I'd shoot my son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. I mean, has the church helped to relieve or reinforce feelings of shame and fear for positive people? Um, that's a difficult one, but I think I think that particular vicar in question probably wasn't in the majority <laughs> in terms of the extreme, the extremity of his response. Um, but I do think that those attitudes are pre were prevalent, are prevalent across um, all faiths um, and and beyond faith institutions yeah. as well. Um, I think if if I can if we can take a look at the current pandemic and our response to that. Um, as a, and I know it's it's a long time since H HIV and AIDS hit the Western world in 1981, so it's 40 years ago. But the indifference to HIV and AIDS in the in the 80s and early 90s from the general population was you it's just it baffles me how we let that happen. I'm currently reading How to Survive a Plague, which looks at the the the, the appearance of HIV and AIDS in New York in the 80s. And it's it's shocking. It's really, really shocking. And faith institutions there also um, putting barriers, not necessarily saying hateful words or slurs, or but putting in barriers, institutional barriers for people to get help or for drugs to be developed or, you know, or putting caveats on where funding can go. It can't help these people because it's against our faith, you know, and, and, and all those sort of things. So... I guess it's less about pointing the finger of blame at in like individual people and saying this person said that this person said that it's looking yeah. at a whole institution and going actually our core values here are, are misaligning because when we're, we're not helping yeah. the people that need our help yeah and, and I mean and what's clear from our conversations and from everything you're doing is that HIV today remains highly stigmatizing and shame inducing um but somehow, as I've reflected on the book and the play, and it's a sin, it seems to have tapped into a phenomenon of shame for a whole load of people, most of whom are HIV negative, by the way, of course, yet who have been holding shame for a long time. I wonder why do you think that is, firstly, and are we living with more shame than ever? Oh, <laughs> I... I think when you look at people who look genuinely happy or not happy, fulfilled and living fulfilling lives, I think they're the people to look towards because they're the people that have worked through their shame. We've all got shame. We all have shame about the way we behaved, you know, when we were a teenager or the way that we treated our parents when we were growing up or, you know, or there's, there's, there's so many places in which we hold it. Um, and it, it shame, I mean, for me as an artist, like shame's just everything. It just when I when I look at stories, when I look at plays, when I look at the motivation of characters and what they do, it always comes down to shame. It's like shame always stops us from saying things. Like it, it yeah. chokes us up before we say what we need to say. It stops us from stating our own needs and being adults. And it it takes us being back into being a child, into being a, and it's and it and it it's crazy. I think. When you see, I think there's something very powerful about seeing. What does it feel like? Just state, state, what is it, when you talk about it builds up, like there's a physical thing in about shame, but how does shame feel? What does it feel like? That's really, yeah, do you know what? I think that's one of the things that people come away from watching my show going, oh, actually really made me understand what it feels like to be shamed or stigmatised. Like this idea of stigma we talk about and like, like what even is that word it's very hard to unpick it's a difficult concept um and there's a moment in the show where i talk about the tablets that i take to keep me alive um, and uh and i sort of wonder how many of them i've taken in you know in my life and i take one and then i have to take another and then you know they get they go into a bowl and i'm, I'm listening to will young which has got significance in my story 
and and then and then more pills come out and more and more until the bowl's full and we're talking recreational and then there's white powder and I'm sat forcing these things into my mouth and they're they're actually licorice torpedoes and so my all my mouth goes black and I'm lip syncing and trying to sing the words and also crying to this song and people say that's so powerful because the connection between um the the reliance on drugs and alcohol to deal with um you know the impact of trauma on someone's life is not the easiest thing to to, to demonstrate and that's the power of you know of yeah. art of storytelling of theatre to be able to communicate a feeling what does what does it feel like and I think for me shame feels I mean I, I have an- generalized anxiety disorder which is, comes from PTSD so for me it's actually it's it's physical it's here and it's a tightness in my chest a feeling of um, uh, I guess I guess it's sort of nervousness, but without any danger, without any clear and present danger in front of me. Yeah. So there's a stress response taking place. And I, I used to, you know, I used to sweat an awful lot. And, and I just used to think, oh, I'm just a sweaty person. But actually having, you know, uh, worked with doctors, therapists, all that sort of stuff, realise that's a physical symptom. And our, yeah. our emotional health and our psychological well-being more and more we're you know i've got lots of friends who are psychotherapists and work in this field more and more we're, we're understanding that it's then it's not separate it doesn't work in as separate to our body they work in tandem yeah. with one another so yeah. you know your 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 central nervous system runs down your spine and when your feet when you have feelings of shame they can manifest themselves physically um, yeah. and vice versa and it can be a cycle yeah so so yeah. it's worth saying isn't it that, that shame isn't just shame isn't just being shamed you can anticipate shame which it is it is of itself shame inducing you know you talk about the you're walking with your partner holding hands you, you know part of that fear of getting mugged is actually fear of shaming as well isn't it and that's how it feels when we when we talk about hiv as well when I was researching gay men living with HIV, and it's great to have Vincent Manning with us, um, who's been part of the, the Catholic Christian response to people working with people for living with HIV for many years. But what, what became clear to me is that shame can be understood as that emotional response to stigma. It, it, does that make sense to you? Is that, yes. is, is that how it feels? Yeah, absolutely. It's, and it can often be... Uh, unless you've unless you've sort of analyzed it yourself or within yourself often you cannot that connection you people might not feel or see so they feel these things inside but they've not connected it to the outside the stigma coming in um and i think that was one of the things that i realized how those two things were connected and so i can look although I, ne- I didn't used to look back with compassion on my, my younger self, but I can look back with compassion and go, actually, you were coping with this emotional response to this thing that you didn't even understand. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's okay. You were kind of doing the best with the tools that you had at the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, incredible. One, one of the questions is, um, shame is in everything. Can you explore the difference between shame and guilt? One of the things we talked about when we were preparing for today is, Classically, psychologists will say that, that a guilt reaction is to do with what we do. It's behavioural. A shame reaction um, is about who you are. So therefore, yeah. particularly in the Christian faith, you can, you can, we have a mechanism of dealing with guilt because that's about sin and forgiveness of sins, about what you do. We're less clear about what we can do with shame yeah. because... Shame is about the person and who they are. So a guilty person might say, I feel guilty for what I've done. A shame bound person will say, I'm ashamed of who I am. Yeah. And that and is classically one of the differences. And isn't that interesting yeah. then, if you think of it within a, in a Christian context, you could, the, uh, the Christian church can deal with guilt because it can turn around to the individual and say, well, that's your, you atoned for that sin. That's your, your problem. You did that yeah. thing. You feel guilty about it. Atone for that sin and everything will be all right. But when it comes around about shame, when it's not the person's problem, 
it's not that the, the shame that they feel isn't their issue it's everybody else's it's everybody the church, else's the church doesn't say great what do we how do we need to change to make you feel less shame yeah so that's a really interesting yeah, way when, of putting it absolutely and i think that's when the, that's when certain types of christian theology sort of join the scrum and heap the shame on yeah. yeah, that's the that's the dilemma. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's right. You you described the moment um, in 2017. You've been partying for a couple of days. You look at yourself in the mirror. Can you can you go back to that moment for us and describe the moment of realization? Um, and, yeah. and how do you understand that journey now? Yeah, I think. Um... I mean, I use that analogy and I use that analogy when I talk about my story and about the show, because I think it's, you know, it's quite an easy way to try and explain it. But actually, you know, it was it was more than one time. You know, it wasn't it wasn't this one moment. It doesn't life's not like a film. If that was the film of my life, that's how we, we would show it. You know, you'd show me looking in the mirror and then I'd <laughs> we're waiting for the film of your life. Nathaniel. We <laughs> want the film. Punch the mirror, you know, it'd smash or whatever. And, and um, but actually, I always thought like a sort of a, a you know, a, a, if you want to call it a mental breakdown or, a, you know, a, a crisis like that would be like a car crash, like your life, you know, but actually it was, it was like a car crash, but it was in slow motion. And it was like, I could see it happening. Like all the red flags were there. And yet I still continued and I could see all the bits of my life and, you know, going into a toxic relationship, uh, you know, doing things and certain behaviors and, and, and still going back and, it was and sort of losing the grip of you know my core identity um which you know and i think yeah it was it was a, a number of times i mean one of the one of the things that really i realized it was a problem is you know i would well, i'd be at a party and i'd i'd you know be taking drugs or whatever and people would ask oh is there anything left and i'd be like no there's none left and i would keep some back and i'd be like you know, like a week yeah. after, I'd be like, "That's not healthy behaviour. Like that's that's the that's the behaviour of an addict." And I don't think I was ever addicted to drugs, but I think I was. It was some behaviours that. Yeah, that were that really started to cause. Yeah. yeah, and I think I think what you can do, or what your brain does, um, at a time like that when you're under, you know, acute stress or anxiety or depression or whatever is that your brain does lots of things to protect yourself. So it, it tells it tells a different story. So it convinces yourself, it puts another narrative in place to make things okay. So I was in a I was in a, a, a re, I was in an abusive relationship prior to um making my show. And I knew I was and everyone around me was telling I was telling me I was. But the the story I was telling myself was no it wasn't. And all the evidence was there. And literally, it was like, I can imagine, I could imagine me coming to me, like another version of me looking back at me and going, what the hell? Like, what the hell? If some, if I, if one of my friends was going through what I was going through, you know, I would be shaking them and saying, you need to get out of this thing. Mm -hmm. And yet I stayed because, you know, I was in this downward spiral. I didn't, and maybe I didn't have uh, the self worth or the self love, um, but I was telling yeah. myself all the time that everything was okay, everything's okay, everything's fine, and it wasn't. It really wasn't. Can I just say we there are stacks of questions coming in and a lot about shame here. We we, we know we know this is a big topic, and just bless you all for being honest about your experiences. Thank you so much for these questions. For those of us who are positive and for those of us who are negative, Nathaniel, what can we do with this shame thing, this shame stuff? What, what, what are our sort of, what's our way out of some of this shame stuff? Um, I think for me, part of what I've tried to do is, it's a little bit like you were talking about guilt and the difference between guilt and shame. And that was a really, great way of I uh, think talking about it for me I've tried to break down where where I can have whole compassion for myself because the shame that I feel is actually has been placed on me by a society that is 
inherently homophobic um and and so so then so then you look at yourself with compassion and try and understand it in that way um and actually you know i mean my one of my friends puts it great is like you know it's like homophobia is not it's not gay people's problem it's straight people's problem like it's just like it's like straight oh, people man. sort it out <laughs> Oh, you know, man. it's like things like it's not our problem to sort. You know, and in the same way, sometimes you know, as a HIV activist and an LGBTQ activist, you know, I, I, my partner looks at me and he's like, "You're exhausted," and I'm like, "Too right, I'm exhausted." And he's like, "It's not always your place to fight," and he's right. You know, it's it's we need to support each other, but also we need allies who understand. Um, it's not about talking for us, it's not about taking space, but know when we need carrying, because yeah. um, if we're going to, you know, m keep moving on this march towards true LGBTQ equality and equality across, um, you know, all different aspects of life, then we're going to need everyone on that journey. Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. Um, what do you think us as Christians and the church itself might do to help improve the lives of positive people? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know, really. I guess I love unconditionally. I, I, I you know, you, you describe me as an ex-Christian when, <laughs> with that wonderful introduction. But, you know, I, I do hold a lot of the values that I was brought up with you know, very, very strongly forgiveness, uh, you know, um, and compassion and love and the teachings of Jesus and the stories that I was told, you know, uh, stick have stuck with me and stick with me. And I yeah. do still have them in my mind when I'm thinking about, you know, complex decisions or, you know, when I'm dealing with matters of the heart and friends and family and love and loss and all that sort of stuff. So I think for me, it's about being it's just about being kind i mean it's not that hard um, it's not, <laughs> uh, that, hard. It's it's not, not that, that hard it's not that hard and and you know there's a thing with hiv um which part part of the stigma comes from obviously from the way that it's contracted um although you know you can actually although it's very rare in the uk these days you can actually contract it from a parent as well vertical transmission is nearly eradicated in the uk but it's interesting when you talk to somebody who is I've got friends who have been who were have been HIV positive from birth and they they sometimes get asked that question and they they I remember a friend of mine saying I sometimes don't want to say I got it from birth because that sort of inadvertently shames anyone that didn't and I sometimes yeah. think that with this because on the on the title it says first time so it's like oh I'm the innocent one you know, like I was 16, I'm the innocent one, poor me. Um, and anyone, you know, if you slept around or went to sex parties or, you know, or, in, you know, injected drugs, you're a bad person. And it's not like that at all. You know, it's at the end of the day, HIV is a virus. It will do, it's an intelligent low life. It will do what it needs to do to survive. survive. So, so I think it's about, yeah, about disconnecting how a how a, a virus is transmitted to someone and the behavior from yeah. someone living with it because they're two yeah. separate things let me um i just want to come back to the allies thing i've just seen a brilliant comment from andrew andrew great to have you with us the lgbtqi plus community needs allies with them advocating with and for us they put themselves at risk. They are our quiet, unsung heroes using their herd voice to support us in places where we are ignored. What does that mean? That means if you're not LGBTIQA plus tonight, we need you to be our ally. If you're watching this and you're negative, positive people need you as allies. That's what that means. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. I want to go to some questions. And there's loads of them. And um, Nathaniel, do you get struck now with feelings of shame? How do you deal with it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank um, you, Paul, for that question. And I, I'm, I, I tr one of the difficulties in in my journey, um, you know, and when when your story gets packaged up as mine has done, you know, I mean, I can't even imagine the amount of people that know my story now and in different outlets and different ways it's been told, you know, and if you have to tell your story in three minutes on a news broadcast, is that there is almost this narrative that, like. I'm like a, a perfect angel now, you know what I mean? Like I talk, I talk about 2017 and you know all that sort of stuff. And it's like mm, I'm still a human. I still am learning and growing every day. I still slip up. I still make mistakes. I still sometimes slip into old habits and old behaviours. I think now, uh, you know, I'm I'm 34 and I'm learning much more about how they're related to stress in my life. How I can, you know manage that better how i can look after my mental well-being better so that i if someone described stigma to me as an assassin from the side like wow. it comes when you yeah. comes when you least expect it it's like you're walking through life and you think you've dealt with it i always say this about hiv you, you get re-diagnosed at these points you're like i've dealt with it i've dealt with hiv everything's fine and then something else yeah. happens. You're like, oh my god, I'd not even thought yeah. about that. And all that, all that stuff yeah. comes flooding back. And even recently, you know, I would consider myself to be, a, you know, well on that journey to reconciling my diagnosis and living with it. And even recently, I went into a new relationship, and my the uh, my now partner um, said to me, I um, I said, you know, I'm on I'm on medication. I'm undetectable, so you know, it's safe for us to not use a condom if that's um, your choice and and he was like oh, well, i'm on prep and he was like and i'm going to keep taking prep because i don't want it always to be your responsibility to carry and uh, <laughs> and i mean that literally changed my world and i didn't realize that from the age of 16 i had carried this weight of responsibility around transmission yeah. Yeah. and we can get into about legalities and mor morality and all that stuff about it but i you know, I hadn't realized the weight of carrying that and the, and the expectation from other people as well, that I had to protect them all the time. So again, a, a whole new thing of realizing and going, actually, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not you my responsibility all the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Absolutely. And absolutely. you equals you is, yeah. a, a, you know, that, that I love that thing. And my outreach project is called In Equal Parts for that kind of reason because it's leveled the playing field prep and medication have leveled the play the playing field so hiv positive people don't have to count the burden of responsibility um around transmission yeah. it's everyone's responsibility yeah gail um fantastic question where did you find your strength for 15 years when you told no one about your diagnosis thank you for that gail i mean i think i to be to put it frank gal i don't think i was very strong um <laughs> but i no, i i know what i did is i did i used distraction you know um i was i continue to be a straight a student and i i'm it's not uncommon you know for lgbtq people um i think it's particularly common for gay men to throw themselves and become perfectionists um we can see it in the way that we you know in the way that we groom ourselves and present ourselves and sometimes in our bodies and then also you know high flying jobs and all that sort of thing so i threw myself into my studies i got you know i got a first degree i always excelled i was a perfectionist in every sense of the word um and i think that was my sort of coping mechanism and then also was like i'm this loud and proud gay man which i was i was living you know this thing but i realized that it was a little bit hollow because i'd not quite understood what pr pride really meant um yeah 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 and it was actually i mean i say when i go do lots of talks you know i say i look around at our community that celebrates pride but so many of us are still drowning in shame behind closed doors it's true you know um and i went what can i do to address that because i want to live truly proudly as who i am you know what's and all you know good and bad Hannah, um, wonderful question. Are you proud of the person you've become, Nathaniel? Uh, <laughs> yes, I am. Um, yeah, a little bit of a humble back. I am. I am proud because, you know, I I acknowledge that back in 2017, I, I could have taken a dip, very different path. Um, and I, I'm sort of a no, I have no question in my mind that that could have been quite a dark path. Um, 
uh, both you know mentally and the things that I was doing could have continued to spiral. Um, so I'm proud that I escaped that and that dark place and that I found the strength to do that. Um, and I'm you know it's very it's very humbling it has to be said the position I'm in and I take my platform really you know really seriously. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But I st I get messages or you know every day from people i mean when my story was first out uh, it was shared across the world um via the bbc's networks and i was getting messages that, i mean in in their thousands i couldn't ever possibly respond to all of them um from people all across the world um so <clears throat> it's really humbling to know that just just by speaking my truth it has helped so many people in a small way i think your, i think your story um has transformed and is transforming people's lives your honesty and your openness and your willingness to put yourself out there and be vulnerable and to share that story for certainly for positive people is just incredibly shame crushing um, and for that we give you huge thanks do you think your acting has helped you overcome your shame thanks Gail um do I think uh acting just makes me more anxious to be honest <laughs> uh, Honestly, it's not. I know right. that feeling tonight. <laughs> it's not. It's not the right career choice for an anxious person. I tell you, um, it's I, well, actually something interesting around that. My acting career, I sort of, I, I it was bubbling under the surface for a number of years um, after I graduated, but it never really went in the, the the way I wanted it. And I realised, I've realised now on reflection, having things sort of, sort of slightly changed, that I was putting all my energy in the wrong place. You know, I was trying to fit in as somebody that I wasn't. I was being told to tone down my gay because, you know, you won't get roles and all this stuff. And I was trying to impress the wrong people. And the minute I just, and there was so, that's so anxiety inducing. And actually I thought I was just a bad actor. Like I was just wasn't going to make it. You know, I was like, fine, you know, I'll go into a different career. Um, and then that was why there was such a fearlessness when I made this, because it was real yeah. all or nothing moment, you know, personally professionally it was just sort of everything went into this my heart and soul and then i didn't try to be anyone other than me and yeah. it paid off the right people took you know took note and um and and yeah and the confidence builds with each with each you know each role and each new audition or self tape that i have to do it grows and that that um, I, you know i hope that will be that will help me with that anxiety with that shame that i feel Amazing. Um, we're going to go a little bit churchy, so get ready. Um, there are um, lots of different people joining in tonight. I'm absolutely delighted um, that the Bishop of Manchester is with us as well, um, and thank you for joining us. Nathaniel, in the Church of England, we talked before when we met, we're in the middle of this massive conversation about human sexuality, identity, relationships, marriage, the whole kit and caboodle. Nothing controversial in it at all, of course. What, what would you say if the Archbishop of Canterbury was with us tonight and he was here wanting to hear what your message is to the church? What would you want to say to him? Um, I think, you know, I mean, human sexuality is the most natural thing like in all its expressions um, and the way that you express that. And as long as what you're doing is not of harm to yourself or anyone else, I can't see why it's anyone else's business, to be honest, quite frankly. Um, so, I mean, for me, sex, I mean, talking about sex in the church and sex, I think cause, because sexuality has the word sex in it, it, the church finds it almost impossible to talk about. Um, and, you know, I could talk about sex till the cows come home and, you know, and it, it, it's, it, it doesn't bother me, you know, like I think it's the most beautiful thing in the world um, to express yourself. And when, you've, when you have good sex, it's amazing. And it's an amazing, it relieves stress, tension, you know, it's, it, if you're heterosexual, it's, it creates new life. It's, a, it's a, just an amazing thing. Why would, why would any God think that that was, why would he give us that and then make us feel shame about it? Like, you know, it, it's beyond me. Right. So I think, you know, I think it's about trying to find new ways to celebrate that and, and finding new ways to talk about it that are, you know, up, you know, in the 21st century with where everyone else is at, 
you know, and not being stuck in old ways and old doctrines and old ways of thinking. Um, you know, I, I, I also think about talking about talking about sexuality, like I'm gay 100 percent of the time. Like, I'm not just gay when I'm having sex. Like, I would tell you, I'm 100% gay. And if I could be 150% gay, I would be. Like, I, I love it. So, you know, I think there's this thing where we talk about sexuality. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, we know what you do in the bedroom. It's like, when, when you say you're heterosexual, I'm like, yeah, I know what you do in the bedroom as well. Like, <laughs> it's, not a big <laughs> it's not a big secret. Like, I know how my mum and dad did it. Um, so... So I think it's this, this it's, it's that separating out of the, the, the sexual act from sexuality and, you know, and, gen and the talk and talk around sex, sexuality and gender expression, you know, um, they're very, they're very different things. Um, and finding positive ways to celebrate and talk about it, because that's where you break down the shame, because the shame comes from not hearing positive stories about sex when you're young. I think about sex education. It was atrocious for me at school. So bad. I mean, we had it, which is- All I can think of is cucumbers. <laughs> cucumbers and condoms. Cucumbers and condoms. And, you know, and just, it was very much, if anyone's seen Mean Girls, you know, Coach Carr, the, the PE teacher doing, you know, PE teacher doing um, a class and saying, don't have sex, you will get chlamydia and die. You know, it, it was just almost, you know, that send up is not that far from the truth. And sex education tends to be about the mechanics and it tends to be about not getting pregnant and not getting STIs. Yeah, you know, those things are important, like, those are great. But where are we having the conversation with young people about this amazing thing that you can have, you know, in, yeah. in adulthood? Um, that is beautiful and is a way to express yourself and express love. And, and it's free. And it's free, yeah, and it's good for your health. Like, where are we having that positive talk about that? Like, we're not. Um, and I we think want those talks in church. You know, we've got to, we've got to get into a better relationship with the body in church, haven't we? Yeah. Folks, yeah, we're rubbish at this talk. You know, we've got to be able to talk about the body and sex and enjoying the body. Um, yeah, no, that's really good. And actually, Mel's raised a really good point, you know, she loves the stories of overcoming and negotiating shame, but we, we need the story centered on joy as well. And I think that's Nathaniel, what you're leading us to there really, really helpfully. Um, there is life in a post Donald Bassett world. I'm told um, what's next for Nathaniel Hall. Tell us what you've got coming what up. What is next? Well, we've been, so my theatre company, Debbie Theatre um, are running a, uh, an outreach project at the minute I mentioned before called Inequal Parts. And that's been, uh, my my show was put on hold because of coronavirus. Uh, obviously I need to keep everyone safe. Um, so we, we launched Inequal Parts, which is a series of talks and discussions and, and workshops online, um, exploring uh, life with HIV and breaking down HIV stigma. As part of that, we've made three incredible short films called HIV and Me. They're three people from Greater Manchester living with HIV who tell their own stories, really beautiful films, um, which will be coming out um, across Greater Manchester in the autumn, in the, the lead up to World AIDS Day, which is the 1st of December. Um, Amazing. And then also, um, I'm in the process of writing my next show, or just about to do that, um, which is called Toxic. Um, so great Britney reference there. But um, that's going a little bit deeper into shame, actually. That's really going to unpick, I think, wow. um, what... Uh, how shame can impact um, and internalized homophobia can impact. It's not not as autobiographical as this. It's going to be semi autobiographical. Um, and then who knows? There might be a third one, which is proud. You know, like um, I think it was amazing said before. You know that story of how do we how do we skip parts one and two and get to part three straight for our you know for yeah. our young people and our children. Yeah, um, and the truth and then, is, of course, we've got to we've got to go through parts one and two. To get to the pride, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah, and I, and and then also, you know, been a few auditions for other Ooh. tally stuff in the pipeline potentially. But it's just me and you. You can you can tell me. It's just us here. Uh, I'll wait until I get the phone call from my agent. But um, as right. soon as I do, if, if you're if doing. you're watching, Mister or Mrs. Agent or whoever you are, then um, there is only one correct answer. Um, we're going to have a quick fire round. Ooh. I didn't warn you about this, so hold on to your your seat. Quick fire questions as we come towards the end of our webinar. 
Conversion therapy, ban it or allow it? Ban it, ban it a hundred years ago. <laughs> ban it 200 years yeah. ago, man. The one piece of advice to your 15 year old self. Cut your hair. I hear you. <laughs> it was terrible. I hear you. Honestly, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> Um, HIV campaigning, move on, we've won on that, or double down, never give up? Double down, never give up. We're trying to end all new transmissions in the UK by 2030, so we've got nine years on the clock to do that. And also, globally, you know, it still disproportionately affects women and girls and, and people who live in poverty-stricken countries. You know, HIV is not over for uh, right. large parts of the world, so we need to keep, keep Huge going. Huge deal still. Shame. Hold on to it. It's character building. Or, girl, stick it in the trash. Um, maybe somewhere in between. I don't know, like, maybe work through it and then put it in a box so you know where it is. But keep hold of it because it's important. It's part of your history. Nathaniel, um, this is your story and this is your night. You get the last word. What is it that the church and those of us here who are Christians um, what is it we need to hear? What would you like to say to the church tonight? Yeah, the first thing I'd like to say is that I forgot to plug. I forgot to plug my play when you said what's coming up. First, first time's going back on tour. <laughs> it's say, back in November, right? Yeah, so it's it's touring the UK from October. So um, we'll be announcing the right. dates dates in the next four weeks um, or so. Um, it's going from October through to December. Um, uh, Amazing. Going to a, as many places as we can. Lots of uh, south, southwest, southeast, because we did quite a lot of the north in the first part of the tour. Um, and But it's in Manchester for a week as well. And then also into the spring next year. So it's going to be quite a long tour. I'm going to be exhausted. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> what should I, what do I like to say to the church? Um, I think um, there was, uh, we were talking before, before we came on to the webinar with everyone um, about the, the short film that I made with my mom, who was a Christian. Um, uh, and we talked, I interviewed her for a doc short documentary about uh, faith and having a, a gay son with HIV. And, and one of the things she talked about in that was how, how the shame, she didn't feel any shame about me, but how the societal shame actually controlled her as well. And how the shame within the church stopped her from saying things that she wanted to say. Um, and... Uh, and it was it was a very powerful moment and a, a moment of understanding for me and compassion from for my mom you know you see your parents always you know you're always the child but all of a sudden you could see them as a I saw her as an equitable adult and still just trying to work everything out like we all are um and I think that it's really you know, when you come out you don't just navigate your own shame you navigate the shame of everyone around you as well and it was really interesting because I used to hold a lot of tension and resentment towards that like why did other people around me particularly my family struggle to talk about this thing because i needed them at that point but she goes on to say that now she's worked through that and she would happily stand up and testify and talk about you know having a gay son loving you know everyone regardless of the sexuality or gender within the ch within a church context and i think that's for me that's what it's about we talked about allies before and it's about when you're in an institution, it's it's quite easy to be to to be a, to be one of the crowd, to be part of the flock. You know, to use yeah. religious language again. You know, being in the flock, yeah, and being yeah. safe, and not putting your head above the parapet. But actually, I think if there is if there is inequality, injustice, if there's discrimination going on, we need people to step up. And particularly if you have if you carry privilege, you know, I carry privilege. I'm a white cisgendered man. I have tons of privilege in this world. I can step up and people listen to me. So it's, yeah. you know, it's my duty to, to speak, um, to support others in that way as well. So I think it's about that. It's about not being, not just going along with the flow for an easy ride and, and recognizing when actually it's time to maybe kick up a bit of a fuss, um, you know, and shake things up. Oh, a little amen bit. to that. Oh, amen to that. <laughs> Um, I have to apologise to Mel, who I um, uh, uh, misgendered, so I apologise for that. We do need more stories of unmitigated joy and celebration. Uh, absolutely, we do. And uh, I promise, um, I promise we do. Um, 
Nathaniel, that's us. Thank you so much for all you've given us tonight. Um, we love you. We look forward to seeing more of you on stage or on screen. Um, thank you, Carl, for um, your BSL interpretation. While we've been rabbiting on, you've been carrying on doing your business. Thank you so much. Um, as I said at the beginning, if you've been affected by anything you've heard tonight, then please reach out. You're absolutely not alone. Seek some support, not least get in touch with the team at Open Table, who are happy to help you at any point and to help point you in the right direction. If you'd like to consider a donation to the amazing work of Open Table, a link is going to magically appear um, and uh, we're grateful. They're grateful for all they've received. Thank you so much. Next month, the Open Table Network Q&A is a chance to find out more about our coordinator, Kieran Bowen. Kieran is one of the founding members of the first Open Table community in Liverpool. Uh, it began in 2008. In July 15, Open Table became a network of LGBTQIA plus affirming worship in communities. And Kieran began supporting the development of the network. Kieran's going to be in conversation with Sarah Hobbs, um, co-chair of Open Table, on Wednesday, the 28th of July at 7 p.m. And I want to thank you all for coming. I know at the end of a Thursday, you might be gagging for your dinner or dying for a drink. Well, the time's come and you can go and do that. Nathaniel, I love you. Thank you once again for sharing with us tonight. Your story. My pleasure. Thank and you for having me. Bless you. Thanks, everyone. See you later.